<clears throat> loud enough. <clears throat> okay, I want to start right out by thanking you all for coming because it's a pretty tough night to be here. Like I was telling uh, Chell and others, every person that came up to me at the college today I was in here teaching said, oh, we can't make it tonight. So I thought, there's not going to be anybody there. <laughs> so I'm glad to see you came out, and it's just great. And um, I want this to be a celebration of wilderness, and hopefully we'll get a little bit of back and forth going too. I have a trivia contest at the end if we have time. We'll take a look at that, and, and I can sign more books after the presentation if you're interested. But just to get one thing out of the way right, right off the bat, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm a crazy guy. I'm just crazy. And you're going to see a lot of weird stuff as we go through this. And uh, the other thing I wanted to announce is we have a mystery guest here tonight. And I'm not going to tell you who it is until that mystery guest comes up. So I think, think it might be you if you're thinking. <laughs> <clears throat> so as I added there to my... My subtitle, I just stuck that in as a text box, My Wilderness Heart and Soul in 90,000 Words. And it's, uh, it's really true. I mean, I, I, I wrote four books profiling other folks and bringing up the history and bringing them up and, and showing them to the public because it was, it was like, a, uh, it was like a, a, a obsession of mine. And in this book, I still am trying to bring a person up, as you'll see, but it's also some of my adventures too. And so it's a little different book, and we'll go from there. So three parts. First, we're going to talk about what is wilderness, how we experience it. That'll be pretty short. Um, and show you some of the most uh, places of the greatest solitude in the, in the Bob and others. The second part's going to be running through the narrative a lot of the internal parts of the book about adventures and tragedy a little bit. And then the last part is going to be a, called A Long Walk with Bud Moore. Now, how many of you uh, know who Bud Moore is? Oh, that's fantastic. We got a baby crying. All right. <laughs> I just got a grandson. He's nine months old. So. Um, so anyway, one of the things about wilderness is solitude. How do we get solitude in wilderness? Uh, how many of you have been to Almeda Lake? Look at that. And it's just not that far away, and it's total solitude just up by Essex, and you don't have to hike that far. But you know why it has so much solitude? Because of that. <laughs> it is the brushiest trail I have ever, pretty much the brushiest trail in the Great Bear. And the Forest Service, I think, is afraid to even clear it. I don't know. They, they have a few times. But anyway, so solitude can be, be formed by, by just the difficulty to get to a place. And when we have solitude, we have wonderful things, like this beautiful West Slope Cutthroat. Look at the colors. I mean, no world but the flathead. You see things like that in general. And, and of course, other types of solitude indicate because they're so far back in. How many of you have been to the junction of Young's and Danaher in the Bob in the South Fork? Okay, a number of you have. Now, that's you could get solitude there pretty well because it's so far. It's so far in there. And that's also what has kept the fish population so part of it is so good in there is because it's uh, a long ways in there. It's not a casual hike. People say, well, you should have, uh, you know, the Smith River, you have a permit system there. But the south of the Smith River is, how do you get on it? You drive right up and you put in. Well, the South Fork, you got 24 miles minimum to get into where you put into this spot on the South Fork. Then we have the area around Big Prairie. How many of you have been to Big Prairie? Great. I'm just sort of celebrating a wonderful places we have uh, in our wilderness so close. And a Big Prairie Sunset, I was the station guard in there, a volunteer for... Um, 10 days in July of 2018, and I got took pictures of some of the one, most wonderful, wonderful uh, scenes I have ever seen in the Bob. Because when you're in there and, you, and you're sitting in there for 10, 10 days and sitting out on the on the on Big Prairie on the runway there, the old runway, and you're watching everything settle down and the sun come down, it's just really spectacular. And you, on the left, what do you see on the left hovering around here? What do you think that might be? That's actually an orb. No, I'm just kidding. It's not an orb. <laughs> but to me, the wilderness is sort of supernatural. And when you think of all the people, the, the hundreds of people that have worked at Big Prairie and the, the dozens and dozens of rangers that were there when it was its own ranger district, they had to have left something there of themselves. <clears throat> and however you want to figure that theory out. We know there's DNA and elements coursing through the land in there that were in their their bodies and and so on and so we're all sort of part of this big 
wonderful, what I call a collective soul of the wilderness and the animals that are in it, which includes the cutthroat trout and the pine marten, bull trout. And if you read my wilderness life, you'll see a lot of my wacky interpretations of the souls of all these animals. Because I don't really mean there's, they have an individual soul, but I think they have a collective soul. And you can read about it and see what you think. I'd love to hear from you and see what you think about it. So the White River is a place that it just seems to, everybody seems to end up there. If you go very far back in the Bob, you always seem to end up at one, sooner or later at the White River. How many of you have been to the White River? Okay. It's very remote, and it is an incredible stream. You look at it, and what do you see? You see all this bright colored cobbles, and you think, oh, there's not many fish in there. There's a lot of fish in there. <laughs> there's a chapter in my book called White River Interlude, and I, we, we detail out all the different fish we saw snorkeling in there. And the very first, the very first surveys of the Upper South Fork tributaries in 1981, and I had a lot of great times doing that. Now, Tilson Lookout, I was talking to some of the lookout folks, it doesn't stand anymore, but it's still, you can climb up to the top. And I did this in Big Prairie. This is 2018. Climb up from Big Prairie and you, um, you uh, look out over where the lookout used to be. And you're looking up the White River there. So if you're looking up the White River, what do you think this little range is here? What's on the other side of this on the east side? The Chinese Wall. Okay, this is the west side of the Chinese Wall. Now, take a look at this mountain here. Anybody know what mountain that is? That is Rampart Mountain. Does anybody know what the distinction uh, in, of Rampart Mountain is, why it's important or unusual? There's a group of folks, and it's, it's like a family. They go around the United States and for each state, and they try to find the most remote spot in the entire state. They use a GIS process. I'm not sure what all they use. I mean, Tim, Tim Eichner here is would probably understand it, but this is the most remote spot in Montana. The most. It's, it's so many miles, like 16 or 18 miles from the nearest, as the, as the raven flies, from the nearest way to access it. So now you know what the most remote spot in the Bob is, and you can go visit it. And that's where I was snorkeling in White River Interlude, so check me out there and see what you think. But it, anyway, it's so awesome. And up this way, you have Needle Falls, and it's, it's, it's very remote. So we also know, as far as wilderness, it's defined by, by Robert Marshall. And you can see Bob there. I think that's in the canoe, uh, Boundary Waters canoe area. I even said, had people tell me they thought that was staged. I don't know what you think, Bill. Uh, Bill, what's that? Okay, one stage. <laughs> Bill is the um, Wilderness Society director for Montana. And so he wrote a couple of landmark publications. On the right, wilderness as a minority right. And what he meant by that was, yeah, it's true that not many percentage, a very tiny percentage of people in the United States will ever be able to experience true wilderness and hike, be able to hike far enough. But he said they still should have the right to do that. And the other guy was arguing against them. This was in the Forest Bolt in 1928. How old, how old was Bob Marshall in 28? He was 27 years old. And he, he's writing in the National Forest Bulletin which is hard to find, by the way. Then his, his next paper, the one that is really his landmark paper, is the problem of the wilderness. And in that, you'll find a lot of the language that's in the actual Wilderness Act. And he, that was in 1930 in Scientific Monthly. He was 29 years old. And when he came to walk across um, the Bob, when he was, when, when his, his, uh, prom, uh, his uh, um, minority right paper came out, he was only 27. So think of your field, whatever field you're in, and imagine 27, 28, 29-year-old people being the, the greatest thinkers in your field. That's how far ahead of his time he was. Just really stunning. And I found, I just stumbled on, I wanted to share with you, it's a little bit off, but uh, I just finally stumbled on to his, his PhD project in, in publication. And it was the very first uh, ecological monograph in 1931. And I thought he was going up, my favorite books about Bob is when he writes about going to Alaska and traveling all over uh, the Brooks Range, naming mountains. <clears throat> and he was supposedly doing that for his PhD research. Well, he never, he was too inspiring for me and he never really wrote that up. So he got his PhD, believe it or not, this guy got his PhD looking at conifer seedlings in a, basically in a greenhouse. 
<laughs> which I thought was pretty ironic. And I finally found his dissertation. And there it is. And uh, uh, yeah, this was the first, this was the first, I'm sorry, the ecological monograph. It's his dissertation about the effect of different levels of water on this, on the uh, wilting of pine seedlings. So now you know, very obscure fact about Robert Marshall. So as I mentioned, we'll just go over them really quickly. Uh, these are very familiar. These are Bob's uh, tenants he put together when he was 29 years old in The Problem with the Wilderness. No permanent inhabitants, uh, no mechanized transport, preserves as nearly as possible the primitive environment, physical, mental, aesthetic benefits, sufficiently large for multiple days of travel. So that's what we're going to talk about here in a, in a little bit more. So when I was going through this with, with Chell Peterson, the Lookout Association, he wanted me to pull something out of the book where, where we see the breadth of the bob and how to walk through it and so on. So one of the chapters in the book is called My Dash Through the Bob. And in that, in that dash, I wanted to do 40 miles before I was 40 in one day. <clears throat> now, if you've ever read much about Bob Marshall, you know that that's his modus operandi. Uh, in fact, when he went through the, the, the uh, Bob that, that time in 1928, late August, he, he, wrote, he went for five days, 189 miles. It's like average almost 40 miles. And so I have been inspired by him. I was running around in, when I was 18 in the Bob of carrying that map that had that picture of Bob with that all weighted down. It was the Forest Service map that came out in 72, I think. And he was my inspiration. Oh, I, I want to be like him. You know, and then, so finally, <clears throat> in 1992, I was already 38 years old, and I did my own dash through the Bob. And I'll explain it to you a little bit here. So, so I started at Holland Lake at the uh, Owl Creek Packer Camp. How many of you have been there or at Holland Lake? Went up over to Upper Holland, <clears throat> over Pendant Pass, uh, <clears throat> down past Big Salmon Falls to Big Salmon Lake. So how many of you have been to Big Salmon Lake? It's an awesome place, awesome place. I was at Big Salmon Lake at 11 a.m. that morning. And I'll show you how, tell you how I did, was able to do that. I actually rode a bike. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so then down the South Fork of the Flathead, I remember by the time I got to Black Bear Guard Station or Ranger Station, I was kind of laying there kind of dazed, a little bit dazed. And I was listening to the little ground squirrels chirp. You know, the things that people call um, gophers, but they really aren't. They're Colombian ground squirrels. And I said, gosh, am I going to be able to make it another seven miles or so? But the river was too high. And I looked at it, and I said, oh, I don't think I'm even going to try the, the ford or Black Bear. I'm going to have to go up off the bench and go all the way back around to get to the trailhead, and that's 11 more miles. Can I do 11 more miles? Well, I think I can. And so I was able to do it. But let me tell you a little bit about it. So at the Owl Creek Packer Camp that night, <clears throat> there were some cowboys and packers, and they were – my son, Kevin, was just fascinated by them. He's 32 now. But he was looking at these guys, and they just loved them, you know, because most of the backcountry people love kids. They love to just get a hold of them and get them in the backcountry. And what they said was the typical – remember, this is before all the all – the, uh, ultra marathoners and stuff that went through. It's very common now to go through the Bob like I did, but it wasn't as common then to go that far. And here's what they said to me. What do you think they said to me when I told them what we were, I was going to do? I'm crazy. At least take a sleeping bag. You're never going to make it. It's too far. You know, and all that. And I, I said, because I was kind of uh, a little bit overcome, I said, oh, it's a piece of cake. I've walked 30 miles lots of time. And with a pack, this is just with a day pack. You can't do this with a day pack. If you don't make it, you're going to be in trouble. I thought, you know, really? I mean, you start a fire and sit there. And take... <laughs> but, but anyway, um, so I thought, well, I'm going to try it. And this is, this is the, the last picture I took of my um, son and, and uh, the cowboy took of the son, my wife, my son, with his blankie and me that night at Owl Creek Pack Camp. And I started out 4.30 the next morning. And he reached Upper Holland Lake at 6 a.m. Big Salmon Falls, 8 a.m., where I met some people that knew Gordon Ash. And then in the book, I, I go off on a tangent and talk all about Gordon Ash. How many of you know Gordon Ash? Yeah, there's some great stories about Gordon in that book. It was at Tango, which is about mile 15. Uh, I think that was about, yeah, mile 15. Big Salmon Creek, and then down this beautiful, if you've ever gone down from Pendant, down Big Salmon to Big Salmon Lake, uh, that it's almost like a cut through the, the ridges, uh, the mountains there, and the rocks. It sits in a cut. It's just beautiful. 
and then to the inlet of Big Salmon Lake. And that's where I was at 11 a.m. How many of you have been to the inlet of Big Salmon Lake? It is the fishiest place. You got, Addy, you've been there? Where the creek runs in? It's where it is, is it's where the cutthroat congregate and feed on the bugs. And the bull trout congregate and feed on the cutthroat. And it's been going on for millennia, millennia, millennia. And it's some of the best fishing and one of the greatest places to go if you really want to have great fishing. You can't deliberately fish for the bull trout, but you can you fish for cutthroat. Occasionally you'll get uh, an incidental catch of a bull trout. <laughs> yeah, some people give me a hard time on that. But So then I reached the Meadow Creek footbridge July 4th, 1992 by 9 p.m. at mile 42. And I thought, and now when I look back, it doesn't seem like it was that hard. But I kept notes all the way, and they're, I, they're pretty much in the book, and it was really hard. It was a lot harder than I thought it would be. And I think, yeah, well, my knees were so shot, I could barely, I had to drag my right leg the last four miles. And so I know, I remember it, and, then I got, and so then I drove around through this thunderstorm back to my house, and I dragged myself up the stairs, and my wife was looking at me, you know, shaking her head, you asked for it type of thing. And so I had gone through some of the finest backcountry in the United States, 42 miles of it. Started that morning. Uh, up the Swan, ended at um, Holland Lake, I mean, Meadow Creek Gorge Trailhead. Then I drove back around to my house and I was walking up the steps all in about 19 hours. And it was, in my theory, I wanted to see what you guys thought about this, but my theory is I've always loved doing this kind of thing where if you're going to see the wilderness, to me it's just so exciting to see it like on fast forward, fast forward in Kodachrome and just go zooming through. Like I still do 30 miles every year, you know, into the Chafer Meadows and back. Because I just love to do it. I don't know exactly why. But and then a lot of people say, well, I want to do it in four days and savor it, you know. Is there anybody else in here that thinks you can experience it maybe in a superior way? How many of you would think the one day thing? See, I told you I'm crazy. Because <laughs> it really works for me. <laughs> uh, so this is the this is the, again the uh, map. And I the only reason this map's in here is because Chell asked me to do it. Uh, just to show the breadth of this wonderful wilderness that we have. And again, just go over it one more time. Started, uh, whoops, started at uh, Owl Creek Packer Camp, Pennant Pass, Pennant Lake, uh, Big Salmon Falls, Big Salmon Lake, down to Black Bear Ranger Station, and on to Meadow Creek Gorge. I was 38, so I was still a young pup then. Um, so now I'm going to take you back through some of the adventures that we had and leads to uh, um, my friend Terry, who I'm, I'm lifting up in this book, uh, when we went to the University of Montana. And I was a fishery student there. He was a wildlife student. My other friends were, some of them were fishery students. But in late September of 73, I wanted to hike up to Upper Holland and go around to Gordon Pass, which is what I'm pointing to here. So I'm 19 right here. And come around over the top to Gordon Creek and Shaw uh, Meadows there, and then come back up over, over Gordon Pass and back down to Holland Lake. I just had an overnighter. And so I did that, and I got back to Upper Holland Lake. And then, and, and going down, well, I went past Pendant. I saw an elk on my way down right before Pendant Cabin. And it just walked along the trail, almost like it wanted to walk with me. And then it kind of dove into the lodge pole. And so that was made a big impression to me. And I went down and up Gordon Creek and then over the Gordon Pass, um, which if you've been, how many of you have been over Gordon Pass? It's really gorgeous because you've got this Lick Lake and just sort of otherworldly view to it. And then back down to Upper Holland Lake. Now, when I got back to Upper Holland Lake, I had gone up there with another guy. He, he decided to just camp at Holland Lake and fish there. But I was coming down to the upper end off of Gordon Pass, and I ran into this. It was an older guy. I kind of think he looked like this. I searched around to try to find somebody that kind of looked like this. And he told me, he said, he said uh, oh, I see you're covering a lot of ground. I said, yep. And... Uh, I said, gosh darn it, though, I saw this beautiful bull elk. I wish it would have been hunting season. And he said, well, kid, it is hunting season. Because you're in the bob and you're in the, there's an early elk bugle season. You could have pursued that elk. 
I said, really? He said, yeah, but don't do it here. I'm going to give you a pass to go to, to the south where the hunting district boundary is only four miles in, four and a half. And when you pack it out, the total pack will only be like five miles or five and a half. Try there, try there. And so I really looked a lot about, he, he claimed to be a Forest Service Ranger. And I, now that I think back, I mean, as a 19-year-old kid, I didn't really know maybe that much about what a Forest Service uniform looked like, but it sure didn't look like a Forest Service uniform. And I never was able to find, there was never anybody stationed. I, I checked with everybody, including the, um, the guy that wrote Swan Valley Place Names. It's really good on history. And as far as I know, no rangers ever been stationed up there, like he said. And when you look at that station that's up there, this is what it looked like. It's a, it's a snowshoe shelter cabin. It's not hab habitable. He acted like he was up there, you know, for the, for the fall or something. So I've had other people kind of try to explain what this is. And maybe you can after I go through the whole thing. But another person thought, this, this is the outline of Henry Thole, the Ranger's Ranger, in one of my books. And he uh, actually is in a number of my books. He was the father of one of the guys killed at the Man Gulch fire. And he, he, went, he went to his death hating the Forest Service because he thought they were responsible for his son's death. He was an incredible ranger. I call him the Ranger's Ranger. Just coincidentally, and I held him up in all these books. Coincidentally, that the day I met uh, this old timer was just a few months after Henry Thole died. And someone, I think it was my editor or somebody, I think it was the spirit of Henry Thole, you know, but I don't know what it was, if anything. But all I know is he gave me this opportunity to go where to hunt. So the next week, my friend Terry McCoy and I drove up Pyramid Pass Trailhead and started into, started into Pyramid Lake. And we, when we passed, got over the pass, it was kind of dusky, but it was still, it was still shooting light. But I decided, oh, I'm not going to try, you know, because deer are open then too, after September 15th. So we went on in and we, we camped. Uh, just before dark at Pyramid Lake. There's Pyramid Peak, there's Pyramid Lake. And what I mean by this message here is, some say that in wilderness, there's little space between the natural and the supernatural. That's what Richard Nelson said about the Koyukon uh, natives in Alaska. That they look at the nature as a lot of supernatural, a lot of presence. It's like you walk through a a forest, and you're really walking through a forest of eyes. Everything is watching. And with, with my theory about the collective soul, you shouldn't offend um, those animals. So if you're going to hunt them or trap them or whatever, you got to do it right and not offend them. And so <clears throat> Terry and I camped along Pyramid. And that next morning, it was really... Uh, it was really dark when he got up. We were going to start firing. He goes, get up, get your pack. I just heard an elk bugle. Come on, come on. I said, I didn't hear any elk bugle. Yes, get up, get up. Get your pack, let's go. So we, we started up over these, and this has burned since then. This is back, when I met back in, in October, or in 1919. Uh, <laughs> not that old, 2019. Because uh, this thing's been bugging me all my life. You know? And so... Terry and I went over these ridges. Every time we get over one of these ridges, we go, there it is, it's over that way, come on. Now, I, back then, I had really sharp hearing. I never heard a doggone thing, nothing. I thought, what is going on here? So it was kind of like, to me, it was like a mystery bugle, like a, maybe he was an elk whisperer or something. Or... So we got up to the top, and I thought, yeah, we're not going to look over this ridge and see an elk. And we looked over the ridge, and there was a bull elk. And he shot once, it was misfired. He shot again, and it went off, and the elk went down. It actually swung around, and then he shot again, and it went down. Because I was about ready to take a shot after the misfire. So Terry got this beautiful bull elk, and I always call it the spirit elk. It was October 8, 1973, and it bugled a tune that only Terry could hear. Now, why is this, and why is this tied together? And why am I so crazy? Well, maybe we'll find out. So we poured it up and brought it down to the lake and hung it in the alpine fir. And uh, 
Terry was working as a, he was radio tracking elk in the Sapphire Mountains as a work study student. He was only 18 years old. And he was working for Dr. Bob Ream. So if you know Dr. Bob Ream, he was a commissioner, good. And, uh, you know, great wolf biologist. Actually, he and uh, um, Diane Boyd are, are, were close friends. And so, so at any rate, the next day, we, we packed out what we could that next morning, and you know, Terry had the rack in the back of his pickup. And I remember at Clearwater Junction, we stopped to gas up. And I remember one of the guys walking over going, that's a darn nice elk. Where'd you get that? You know, kind of thing. So it really sticks in my mind. So what I want to do now is just go through a few more stories and, and uh, uh, incidents and activities I had with Terry and some of my other undergrad people. And then we'll get into the uh, uh, rest of the meat of the story. So when we got to University of Montana, we were pretty green, of course, 18-year-olds uh, that shared an Elrod dorm. And this is Terry right here, let's see. And then my friend Phil Carper and me were kind of a trio that did a lot together. And I'll explain why I'm going through this here in a minute. Well, right, I didn't want to do that. So. We're, we're trying to go to Heart Lake. How many of you have been to Heart Lake and Scapegoat? Yeah, and we thought, okay, we had this like recreational map that somebody was giving out as a promotion, and it just showed Heart Lake being right next to the Landers Fork. I mean, it was just diagrammatic. You can't, obviously, you can't find anything by this map, but we were too dumb to know that. So we rented snowshoes. We were all 18. Rented snowshoes at the rec center, and we snowshoed up. Landers Fork, and we kept going and going. Well, I didn't see Heart Lake anywhere. Look, it shows it's right here. Well, it's actually like a half, three quarters of a mile, and way the heck over a big ridge, you know. But you don't see that on one of these these general maps. So we finally, we finally turned around and came back out, and then went back to the dorm. Well, so we were gone an extra day and a half. Nobody even reported us missing. And we looked at each other and went, you know, we better maybe start being a little careful with this. We could be gone a week and nobody would know it, you know. And so. I got smarter and figured out where Heart Lake was, and the next time we went in, we got there because we wanted to see these Arctic grayling. So this was the same year, and we finally found the right place. <clears throat> but what happened when we took the snowshoes back to the rec center was the guy that was supervising it, who probably doesn't have a lot of authority, you know, so he's kind of trying to exert his authority, and he said, I declare those three pairs of snowshoes destroyed, he said. And then he said, and I also am telling you that you can never rent any more equipment here for the rest of the year. He kind of puffed up, you know. And, uh, and so I'll always remember how we destroyed three pairs of snowshoes. Typical things of not knowing what we were doing. So <clears throat> we went into the scapegoat lot and the Bitterroots in the winter. But this, this is Terry at the scape, uh, in the scapegoat on, on Meadow Creek, up, uh, up above, uh, down from Arasta Gorge into, uh, into Meadow Creek, Meadow Creek Lake. You can see him fishing here. Well. This was the uh, end of our spring year, our first year in, in, at the University of Montana, University of Montana. And I, of course, we were all wanting to get good grades because we all wanted to get into grad school so we could move on and stay in Montana and work. And I wanted to do maybe a grad program here. <clears throat> and so we were fishing there, and I, I just wanted to think, that I thought to myself, we walked down this way. You can see it's, it's kind of like mid-June because the quarter system, you start a lot, you go a lot later in the year. And we had gone over a pass down in here. And so I went down to the East Fork of the Blackfoot. How many of you have been to the East Fork of the Blackfoot? The scapegoat's just not very well traveled. And I, wanted, I was catching these fish, and I go, oh, I, gotta, I wanna mark these fish. You know, just my, my, I wanna mark and come back and see how many of them I've already caught and that kind of thing. Well, I looked around, I didn't have anything to mark them with. And I was catching, you know, a fair number of them. But how do you think I marked them? What's a common way to mark fish, Jim, if you don't have anything to put on them? Clip a fin. That's what I did, but I didn't have anything to clip it with. So what do you think I did? I bit it off. Yeah. <laughs> I bit the fins, uh, the very tip of a fin off of about eight cutthroat. And then I thought I was going to come back and see if, and maybe if I catch eight and one of them's marked when I come back, I have a population, you know, no, no bears. <laughs> I was just, you know, messing around. And I never did get back there to, to check. But, and then we did... We did a lot in the Bitterroots, and we did it mostly in the winter. And one of the trips that Terry was along on, I call the funnel trip, because 
which was what we were doing was was really stupid. My friend Bob and I and Terry drove up to the Bitterroots in my Volkswagen Beetle, and we drove over to the mouth of Kootenai Creek. You guys know where that is, Kootenai Creek? And then we dropped Terry off there. Terry had his skis. And then we drove back over to the mouth of Bass Creek, and we started in from there. I was skiing and Bob was snowshoeing, as I remember. I can't remember for sure. And we were going to meet in the middle, you know, 10 or 12 miles both ways, and meet in, this, in the middle of nowhere. You know, there's no trail defined or anything. Like that was going to work. Well, it didn't work. And Terry didn't make it up there. I remember I put my snowshoe on. I left snow, uh, or my, I think it was my snowshoes I put on. And I left my, um, my friend Bob at the lake because he was sick. He was really sick. And so I went up there and I yelled for Terry and it got dark. And I remember digging into the snow. I was wearing a snowmobile suit. I had that talk taken with me way up there. Never could find him. Next morning, yelling. You know, like yelling is going to really work when you're in these huge areas, you know. Came back to the lake, collected Bob and said, well, we got we to gotta get you down to the trailhead at least, you know. And Terry's probably going to follow behind us. He probably took the wrong turn and he'll come, you know. And I did go down in a, in a pretty, pretty substantial snow slide in this place we call the funnel. So I was a little worried about Terry. So we, we got back out to the trailhead and it got dark and no Terry. And we thought, well, he might be coming around to the Kootenai on that side. He didn't make it all the way around. Or maybe he's going to stay overnight and come out. We didn't know. And Bob was really sick. So I took him back to U of M, to the health service, drove back to Bass Creek, and I'd seen the tracks. Terry had come out. And he came out and he went and he hitchhiked back to Missoula. Well, he was really mad at me. I always felt bad about this because he was really mad at me. He felt that he had been left, you know, and I kind of had this dilemma. What should I have done? I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, it always kind of hurts when I think of that. The other, the last one I'll tell you about here is, Gary, before we get into the rolling uh, part of this is, how many of you have been to the Middle Fork of the Salmon River in the Paschal Canyon? I, okay, a few of you have. And that was another place we went because Dr. Reem, um, he and his wife Kathy, they went, they went there quite a bit, and Corn Creek and lower part of the, like the main salmon. And that's where Terry found out about the Middle Fork. So we did all these crazy things in the Middle Fork of the Salmon. It's the third deepest canyon in, in the United States, from what I understand. You can see us, we're up on top here, and we drop, drop all the way down into that canyon because there's no way of getting up the river from the mouth. We didn't think anyway. And so, and you can see here, there's Terry and Phil and me, the same three stooges I've been telling you about the whole time. And uh, so we, 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 we did that, and we used a little Kmart raft to get around the cliffs. In fact, um, later after Terry passed, uh, uh, my, my friend Phil and I, we went all the way up to, to Big Creek and to the uh, Idaho biological station up there um, on foot and, and then walked all the way out. And, the guy, and as far as we can tell, we're the only ones that have ever done that. But we used, we used this, this, uh, this little raft to get around the cliffs. And you can see poor Phil here. So you paddle around the cliff, then you pull the raft back with fly line, and then you paddle up yourself. So what would have happened if we would have lost the raft? Or we would have been screwed because we would have had been the wrong sides of a cliff or we would have lost all our stuff. Oh, just another example of the wacky stuff we did. Um, when we were in the scapegoat, when we were doing it all through the scapegoat, it was called the Lincoln Backcountry. It had just turned to wilderness in 72. And Middle Fork of the Salmon was the Idaho primitive area. Now it's the River of No Return, Frank Church Wilderness. So Terry continued on in his telemetry study with a, as a work-study student um, for Les Markham. And the, uh, another person who worked on that study was Bob Bell, who was a professor here. Does anybody know Bob? So he was there, too. He was, he was kind of there after. but So... Um, <clears throat> Terry would make these locations for the study, and we came back for our summer jobs, and I was staying at Terry's trailer, and he invited me along on one of his flights. And like a day before the flight, um, <clears throat> they had to switch pilots and planes. This is the Aronica Champion, very small. The capacity is one pilot and one passenger. And so I wasn't able to go with him. And I remember when he left the trailer, I was uh, sleeping, and I kind of half woke up, and I wish I would have said something to him about it. But the next day, after he flew that day, 
we were going to head into Big Salmon Lake and camp out and fish. So I had our packs in my beetle, Volkswagen Beetle. So Terry and the pilot, they lifted off about 6.30 a.m. I was waiting at the forestry building at U of M. Do you recognize this? And he was supposed to be there with our packs. He was supposed to be there at 11. And we were going to go into Big Salmon Lake, into the Bob. <clears throat> so time went on. He didn't show up. 12.30, I finally called Dr. Reem and said, hey, Terry didn't show up. I'm, I'm really worried. And Kathy Reem's journal, she wrote, read it, went back 40 years or whatever, read it, and, and in great big letters she wrote, John Fraley is frantic. Because what do you think if your friend is in a small plane over the Sapphire Mountains and doesn't show back up? Can you imagine what you think, you know? So that resulted in an air search with eight planes, a helicopter ground search, dozens of people. Finally, the plane was located. It had gone straight into the top of the ridge, near the top of the ridge, into the lodge pole, and nobody could see it. We finally saw it um, from the helicopter. And we were out on the ground. I was yelling and screaming for him, which is three more. But I actually was within about a mile and a half of where his plane was, because I went in from Lower Rock Creek, and I was going up Cinnamon, uh, Cinnabar, and Karen, that's not too far away. It's a wilderness now called the Welcome Creek Wilderness. So I carried this Missoulian around with me my entire life. And think about, you know, all my stuff loaded in a Volkswagen, moving here, moving there, all over the place. I've lost pretty much everything I own except for this. <laughs> and I've lost this a few times where I couldn't find it again. But it obviously meant a lot to me. And you can see uh, two killed in airplane crash. And they had to actually bring in smoke jumpers. You can see the chutes here, the slots in that chute. The plane was right below that chute. This is what the crash light looked like not long after it happened. Again, this was fall of 1974. But I had to go back in and look and kind of explore it. More on the surface, uh, services for Terry on the Oval. 19 years old. And think of how advanced he was, flying for elk and doing all that radio telemetry when he was only 19 years old. He had such great promise. So I want to bring him up in profile. So we built a monument. They built a monument. That's me right there. That's Phil. And it was a really nice monument. It's on the Three Mile Game Range. It's now pretty darn hard to find. And the sapphires were, are behind there where Terry did a lot of the flights. So I met, I got to know his family pretty well. Um, <clears throat> in fact, Cindy, his sister, I just kind of slid right into when I started visiting them because I was the same age as Terry, obviously, and she was his favorite sister, only sister. And she and my wife, Dana, ended up having children at about the same rate. Yeah, so, so we would visit them. And I have a picture of Beverly here with... Uh, my daughter on one hip and Cindy's daughter on the other hip. So he got to know his family really well. They were devastated, of course, and didn't really understand what happened. I did take them into the plane crash site the next year, but we never did get very many answers out of the, you know, we could never, I tried getting the coroner's report and I couldn't get it. Tried, you know, a number of times. Uh, it's, it's between Mineral, Mineral County and Missoula County. And there was these rumors and of what had happened. Well, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this fairly quickly. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to look, go back and look at three places to try to find some meaning in this or some sort of a spirit in this. And I wanted to go to where the spirit elk fell. I wanted to go to where the monument is. And I wanted to go to the plane crash site and go re-explore it. So my daughter and I went into the into the Spirit Elk spot, and we had pictures from 1974, and we have, we're, we're at Pyramid Lake, and you can see we're at the exact same spot where the butchering was done. And we went up to the peak, and I was trying to find the place where I, in the 80s, I'd gone up to that peak, and, a, and kind of a wind whisk went <laughs> over the top of the mountain. I thought, geez, is that what a spirit sounds like? So I was, I was curious about that. And you can see there's Pyramid Lake, and these are the shelves where Terry got the elk. I, 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 this was in 2019. So looking around, maybe find the slugs. So we knew right where it was. Find the slugs or a drop pocket knife or something. Never could find anything. And it's kind of futile, but I wanted to try it. Because really what I thought 
might happen is I might get another wind gust or something. <laughs> but it didn't work. I didn't. I didn't. Sometimes I think I think the wilderness is very spiritual, but it doesn't always act the way you want it to act. You know, it's not going to happen exactly when you want it to happen. My daughter did find seven uh, sacral vertebrae, and they're very inert once they, uh, you know, because there's very little marrow in the, and it's you know slim possibility it could have been from the spirit elk, but that would have been 50 years ago. I know I've seen I've seen weathering of vertebrae that went 12 years or so that hardly ever changed. So who knows? And my sister was out that year. 2019, and we went back in to the monument, and what we saw on the way in were these swarms of pine butterflies. And they only come out about every 30 or 40 years. And it seems like on the, on the, on the forest there in the sapphires, the last example they had was from right about the year that the, the plane went down. And so, and they were thick. You can't really see it that well around my do, uh, sister, but I mean, they were like 30 or 40 butterflies in every frame. And you know, if you look up butterflies, what do they generally signify in spiritual? They generally spiritual. They generally uh, represent uh, comfort and that things are okay. You know, it's like if you want to think of it as a uh, message from the afterlife. So that's that's what you read if you go on the internet. You know, I don't know about any of this stuff. And we found the monument it was not easy to find. And look at how it's hardly changed at all in 50, almost 50 years. It's amazing, really. Still looks really good because you've all seen gravestones that don't look nearly this good when they're 10 or 12 years. So it's, and he's not obviously not buried here. He was buried back in Pennsylvania where his home is. But this was a monument. So then we relocated the crash site. And this turned out to be a lot harder than I thought it would be because there's been a lot of down timber, low down stuff since then. This is when I went back actually in 1998. And you can see somebody's. You can see, you can see if you know what you're looking for, you can see Les Markham right here. He was one of the PhD students on the study. So then I finally got the NTSB report, and my oldest son is the one that found that for me. Because we all, you know, like, like Cindy told me, that no one wanted to talk about this. Her parents didn't want to talk about it. Um, nobody wanted to really let us know what happened. What, what condition were the, I mean, did they live after the crash? Because it took us two days to find them, because they didn't have a locator. Did they try to get away? Did they... And so the NTSB report says elk survey flight, pilot lost control, uh, low altitude, steep turn, recovery date, 9174, two fatalities. So at least we know that uh, something about the pilot, his age was 22. He had 274 total hours and 64 in type and not instrument rated. And I don't have anything against this pilot. It's just coming off the sheet. Well, there had been some rumor in the family that they just grabbed somebody that was a, like a student and, and borrowed a plane and went on this. So that's obviously not what happened, but they still had a fairly inexperienced pilot. So we went back into the Sapphires. We were going to find that plane, plane site. Don't worry, I'll get us done by, by eight here. And the first time my daughter and I tried, and we didn't have the right coordinates or something, and we couldn't find it. It's like a sea of lodgepole. I mean, there it is. And this. We'll talk about it in a minute. Does anybody want to guess what that is? That uh, this is a this is a 2018 uh, 14 Google Earth, and if you looked at 20 or 1973 or whatever, that wouldn't be there. So that's a well, no, it's actually a a heliport cut by the smoke jumpers to to evacuate the bodies. So we went back in there, pretty, and it, I mean it is an elk infested place. <laughs> Terry was studying elk in a great place, and it was so beautiful. And we, there's the clearing that the smoke jumpers cut 70, uh, 44 years before. And you can see all the, to my daughter and, and my youngest son. And the cockpit, it always bugged me, the cockpit looked fairly intact. And <clears throat> the seat belt, this is what really one, we wondered about. The seat belt was hanging straight down. The other one was kind of heck, I mean, Terry's seat belts. So we were wondering, what does this mean? Does it mean he was trying to get out? Does it mean he got out of the plane? We didn't know. And, you know, we couldn't get any details. Because, you know, it's not something you really want to talk about, especially the university. Um, and this is what it looked like in 2019. Continues to go into the, into the land. There's the antenna he probably taped on that morning. Because they used, if it really was the first time they used that plane, he had to temporarily put the antenna on. So we left a memorial there for him. 
and we walked out and we felt really good. I fin finally felt like I had some closure as far as visiting these sites again. Well, I called Les Markham the next year in 2020 and he picked up the phone and he said, I suppose you're calling about the fire. I said, what fire, Les? Well, Karen Ridge and Cinnabar Ridge and the plane crash site are burning. They sat there for 45 years. We went in there for that last time. And I thought I was done going there, which I am, by the way. <laughs> I'm not that crazy. And it was burning. It turned into a 4,000 acre fire and swept up over where, pretty much where the plane was. There's probably very little chance it didn't burn it. So at this time and through 2022 here, uh, early 2022, I've been working on this book. And Rick Trembath, who I know some of you know, right? How many of you know Rick, the fire guy? He kind of asked me what I was working on. And I said, well, I explained. And I said, gosh, I wish I could find the smoke jumpers because that would be the key to trying to figure out what ha really happened. They were first on the scene. And uh, he said, well, have you tried talking to Tim Love? And I said, well, Tim Love's a good friend. And we've done fisheries plans with Tim and around the complex. But I never thought of him as a smoke jumper expert. He said, call Tim and tell him what your dilemma is. So I did. Tim called Roger Savage, well, another person too. I can't remember his name right now. But, uh, and he called me, Tim called me back like a few days later and he said, have you seen your in-mail today? I said, no, no, I'll go look. They had found all four of the jumpers. I just started crying because I've been searching for him for 40 years. <clears throat> As I suspected, they were close to my age. They agreed to meet via Zoom and take me back to that night of September 1st and 2nd. Describe their jump. So they flew over in a twin beach craft, a pilot, a spotter, which was Jim Sear, and four jumpers. They couldn't find the plane. The helicopter had to come back to locate the plane for them. And then they were able to, to jump. So Luke Lemke was the first jumper out. He says he jumped at 8 p.m. That might be a little late, but he landed right above the plane. And they all did timber jumps. And <clears throat> using a letdown rope, he repelled to the ground, held the ground, removed his suit, and went directly to the plane. And what he said was, I, in, his, in his note he sent to us, was, um, I went over to... I took, immediately removed my suit and went over to confirm the obvious, he said. He, he was pretty experienced and he, he suspected that there was no movement after that plane crashed. And so he went over to the plane, checked Terry's vitals, nothing. Had to move Terry out of the way and checked the pilot's vitals, nothing. So then he, he uh, reported no joy on the ground, no life here. And this is what I heard when I was at dispatch, I think, or someone told me, you know how memory is. But anyway, and it says it in the Missoulian too. And so with the chainsaw that Jim Sear dropped, uh, the jumpers cut that clearing, finished up uh, early in the morning. And this is, uh, these are the helicopters they brought in to evacuate the bodies. The bodies were fairly intact and uh, not a lot of blood or disfigurement or anything like that. And these are three of the jumpers here. And that's the fourth one right there. Come on up, Rick. Let's give him a hand. Talk real close to the mic. Here. Um, I jumped, my rookie year was 74, so I was wet behind the ear, trying to figure out life. Totally. And I had made about 80 jumps over my career, let's say, almost 10 years. And there's like a handful of jumps that I remember. And this is one of those. <clears throat> and because of, I think part of it's Labor Day. Because every Labor Day, I think about that jump that I made on that day, 1974. But there was some really uncanny, almost mystic pieces of this coming together with John and I, and the other three jumpers. Because a little over a year ago, my wife said, Barb, 
was going through all our pictures because that we all do that when we get in our supposed to seven G and I'll be on because you want to crawl through them so the kids don't have to type. <laughs> and we're going through the pictures and those pictures, that one there, and then one of the two helicopters near somewhere all these I took. I had one of those little one can cameras that you can put all into your pocket, and I took that on my jump so I could remember things on seven G. Some of that worked. <clears throat> um, but then Doc Lammers, out of the blue, calls me during this same time. And he said, Rick, I want to get together, because this was Zoom time, because this was COVID. I want to get together with you and the other two and try to remember that jump, because I'm writing memoirs for my grandson. Oh, yeah, that's our boy. And <clears throat> so we decided to Zoom. And we got that it kind of taken care of, we're going through it. And then all of a sudden, John calls me. And so all those things that happened within months of each other just seemed a little bit more than just happenstance. And so I'm, I'm not sure about all that with the spiritual piece and stuff, but there was something there. Um, and a couple of things I remember, I remember the plane crash itself um, and the extracting of the bodies and the sheriff's department came in on foot, and they had body bags, and then we moved the bodies up to the spot we were going to cut the hotel spot. And then we saw it a lot of the night. I had gone back down and picked up, I don't know if I got all the shoes, but I got at least a couple of them because we didn't have sleeping bags and we knew it was going to get cold that night. So we had the bags we could wrap up in. But I also remember how you really couldn't sleep. It was really different being there with the two deceased young men that their lives had way. Um, and as I kept talking to myself, now that I've revisited this a lot more than I had in the past, I reflect on us four jumpers talking, talking <coughs> about our children and our wives and our grandchildren. And I think about these two young men who never had that opportunity, like John and I have, to go ahead with life and have a great life. And it's just, I think that's the tragedy of something like this. Is life changes for so many people down the road that will ever never know that. Um, and what would life have been for them? Okay. On a little lighter note now, um, when we were going through this Zooms, and John was in on one of them, I think, or two, um, we were trying to recall everything that happened. And when you get Four guys over 70 years old trying to remember what happened almost 50 years ago. It's a little bit painful. And I remember one of them said, Well, we're hosting this here. No one really knows what to do. And then after the jump was over and we got the bodies out and the helicopter was gone, we walked out with the sheriff's deputies for their pickup. We got on a road. Drove back to Sheriff Moe. Sheriff Moe was a big sheriff in Jones County at that time. He had a house right on the bitter roof above the climbing trees, down looking on the river. And he brought us up there and he said, at dinner, we had a piece of everything. And <laughs> Doc Lammers said, Well, I didn't go to that dinner. Um, I must have flown back in the helicopter. <laughs> and I said, Doc, I'm going to email you a picture of you sitting. With the sheriff on his balcony at a pic on a picnic table. He said, well, I don't remember that. <laughs> so, um, and then one other piece that just happened tonight, uh, as John and I talked about a little bit, my daughter, Sarah, uh, went to Flathead High, and the little boy that we showed in the picture, they're friends on Facebook, so we know each other really quite well. So <laughs> there's just something really, a circle of something happened with all this. And uh, keep those memories and um, live life every darn day. Thanks, Rick. <laughs> Thanks so much. What a special treat. And yeah, the, the thing with my son and his daughter just happened today. And I just texted him before I came over here and said, did you know Sarah Cunningham? And he, and he said, because I remember, I vaguely remember mentioning someone with that name. He said, yeah, I knew her pretty well, and she was always really nice to me. Why do you ask? And I said, I'll, I'll talk to you later. 
<laughs> Thanks a lot, Rick. Awesome job. So I feel like I've, you know, I lifted up the lives of a lot of old timers in my books and and this 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 has been haunting me my entire life. I've lived this long wilderness life. He had just a short wilderness life. And just uh, finding Rick and the smoke jumpers and, and so on was so emotional for me because for so long we didn't we didn't know. And his sister said, I'll say this, I don't think she would mind too much, but basically what she said to me was, the day we lost Terry, I lost my parents too. They would not talk about it. So other serendipity, I looked up in the site where you can find gravestones. You'd be amazed what you can find. You never find a death certificate on that site. The first thing that popped up was Terry's death certificate. And it puts a final nail, you know, puts the final closure. Why did he die? Multiple fractures, including neck and hemorrhage. Airplane crash. Time between crash or whatever and death, instant. So they all felt a lot better about it. And, you know, you think that, but <clears throat> you'd be amazed at how, how uh, intact that, comp, uh, that uh, place area they set the cockpit. So <clears throat> I feel like I've done what I can do for Terry. And now I want to do a few, few quick things. I've got about five minutes left. So since it's all been so sad, I wanted to go into my favorite funny story. Um, we got, in my book, there's quite a bit of my adventures doing fur bear tracks, surveys, uh, working in fisheries in the South Fork with our uh, fish manager, Jim Vasher over here, uh, was very interested and instrumental in helping the South Fork cutthroat project. I held a fish that was, I held a fish three different times over a seven year period. So I went in there every year and, 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 and tagged fish. So there's a lot of really neat things in there. Uh, but we do these track surveys where we would helicopter in the biologist was Sean Riley, Jim, you know, and because I had said to Sean, well, if I, they came to me and asked me because I knew the middle fork really well. They wanted to do the surveys there, see if there was any, many links. I said, well, I would use Schaefer Meadows for the hub and then go to the, all the different tributaries for the spokes, just like the old trappers did. And I said, the only problem is Schaefer Meadows is um, about, well, if you count the, the road too, it's like 30 miles in there. So we would have to spend so much of our time just getting in there. And Sean said, that's no problem. We'll use a helicopter. And I thought, that sounds good to me. And so we were able to do these, these effective surveys. But I, we had a lot of crazy things happening when we're doing that in the middle of the, the winter. And this is the summary of the, the data over that 10 years. And you can see the number of marten and coyote and lynx and mountain lions. So think of all that coursing through the, the back country and the snows. All those animals are there and they're moving and they're all, it's all this moving population, but you don't ever see anything but their tracks, pretty much. But I was pretty proud that we were able to, to do that. I'm not gonna tell you the mountain lion attack story, but I do wanna tell you the moose story. It's just a second here. So we're, we're skiing up, uh, it was myself, Harvey Nyberg, our wildlife manager, and Jerry Brown, our moose biologist, uh, we were skiing up to Scott Lake. We had to cross the Middle Fork and go up. How many of you have been to Scott Lake? Man, I'll tell you, you've been everywhere. That's a very obscure spot, really. And so we come around this bend. Uh, I'm down on the stream bottom, kind of flat and gravelly. And Harvey's up above me. And I had seen this calf moose ahead of me where the lake comes, the creek comes out of the lake. And I was looking at this calf moose, and Harvey, from about 30 yards up, on the ridge said, do you see that moose? And I thought, he sounds kind of like uh, anxious or something. I said, yeah, it's just a calf, it's right up there. You know, he said, no, I mean that moose. And I looked around and there was this moose charging me. And I had my camera because I was taking pictures of the habitat and I went and fell back into the, with my skis, back into the altar. She came crashing right by me. I had these pictures in my mind of blood in the snow and two bear helicopter rescue, although they weren't even in existence then. This was 1996, I think. And uh, I always got a lot of hard time about it. But anyway, I wanted to give you something a little bit lighthearted. Now, I'm going to close then with the great Bud Moore and his lost journals, his 1972 lost journals that are in my book in the last chapter. Bud was an awesome guy. I've talked to like Shell and Bud Matt and Bud encouraged him for his writing, and um, he was a big fan of Bud's, Bud, Bud Moore. 
big conservationist and he had a long forest service career, did a lot of things like spent three months in the wilderness trapping because he wanted to experience the long line trapping again, try to get the forest service to let him do it uh, like he had in the Loxa. Uh, but he had to get a special permit. <clears throat> and I remember his wife, Janet, um, an awesome woman who was a, actually a state representative for a while. And she said, <clears throat> Bud was pushing 70 and there wasn't a reporter that could keep up with him, she said, because they wanted to go in and see what he was doing way in there, you know. But they couldn't make it. They'd get partway in and come back out. <clears throat> well, Bud and I <clears throat> were really good friends because he did some review for me for my Bob Marshall Wilderness <clears throat> Fish and Wildlife Plan. Um, I promoted his book a lot, The Loxa Story. He wrote, he wrote reviews for both of my first two books. And we were just pretty close. And he said, you know, John, I went through the Great Bear, the proposed Great Bear. They were going to road that thing. We just can't have that. Remember, he was a very respected Forest Service person. He was actually a chief of fire and air operations out of Missoula for a while. And in Washington, D.C., he was chief of fire. And he had a, an eighth grade education. But he's got a brick on the walk of uh, honorary PhDs at the University of Montana. And so he says, let me see if I can find that. Because he knew I was writing uh, Wild River Pioneers. Well, he found it. <clears throat> and it was a 20-page typed up journal of his trek through the proposed Great Bear Wilderness um, with his two dogs. And I said, wow, this is awesome. And, he, and I looked and he had this little yellow, as Chell knows, this yellow tablet where he wrote down. He said, and he wrote this very detailed permission for me to use it. Well, I didn't get it in the Wild River Pioneers, but I saved it for the last chapter of this book. And what I did was I went through Bud, Bud's trail, and he's constantly uh, ruminating about wilderness and talking about how we've got to do this different, that different. I mean, it was, it's, just a, it's just awesome. And I didn't use every bit of it. but And then so my son, Kevin, again, the kid with the blankie, uh, we retraced his steps in, 19, in 2018. And we kept track of it, and it, it, there was a lot of differences. But beyond the fact that, that, it, that it was uh, amazing to watch his mind work and, and support wilderness, but the, the Middle Fork has rewilded. When in 1980, when I was a biologist up there, Cox Creek, for example, outhouses, hammered trails, everything was high use. That, and, and, uh, and, you know, it had, it, the Great Bear had, had not been established yet. So, uh, or barely established. And so it has healed so much. We, I mean, even like Cox Creek, which is six miles above Shaver, it doesn't even, the mainline trail doesn't even look very well used, in, let alone all those structures. They're all gone. So I call it the rewilding of the Middle Fork. But, but anyway, we went on through, and we, and we the second half of the chapter is, is us um, writing what we thought about Bud. And so, so it was Bud and Koyukuk and Kenai. They went through this proposed Great Bear Wilderness. We retraced the steps. This is, this is Dean Lake up in the uh, Trilobite Range. So another one of Chell's maps here. Uh, <laughs> you inspired me to do two maps, and you added five minutes to my presentation. But um, We started at Morrison Creek Trailhead with, with Bud, and we just traced him and read his uh, reservations all the way down into the Great Bear to Schaefer, he camped there the first night. We actually went out and camped at Cox Creek. The next day we went on to towards Gooseberry, um, following in his trail, and then on to Pentagon Pass, which is uh, Pentagon Peak, which is awesome. Dean Lake, which is so gorgeous. Switchback Pass, which is unworldly looking. And I talked to somebody who had found an amulet up there. Uh, so other, other cultures have found it unworldly also and on to Pentagon Cabin and all the way out to Spotted Bear River Road. And so that was his trek. We followed the same trek and added our observations. But what an ama amazing man. He was always thinking of wilderness. So starting at, starting at Morrison, and I kind of like it when the wilderness signs are kind of broken up and stuff. It gives them a nice, and this is what Bill, uh, what Bud called the Middle Fork Boulevard. <laughs> they brought a, a bulldozer in there at one point. And look what they did to it. I mean, it's like almost all four miles into Schaefer. I love it when I'm running because it's jogging because it's really easy, but, but it's pretty, you know, weird looking. And he didn't like it. And they called it the Middle Fork Boulevard. 
and we ended up at uh, he went ended up to Schaefer Meadows and talked to the rangers that were there then and trying to convince them about wilderness and they were pretty good about it. That's all in the book. But this is what this is the rewilding of the Middle Fork. So this is Cox Creek that used to have outhouses and hitching rails and lots of impact. This is we're camped right at Cox Creek. We caught some fish the night before and we slept there. The next morning, Kevin was going to go over into the timber and get our food bag, which we had hung up. And so he went over there and came back and he said, wait till you see what happened. Come over here. So I went over with him and right in the middle of the trail, about 50 yards from our camp, was a quarter of a mule deer, a young quarter of a mule deer. And when he had gone over to get the food bag, he ran into a wolf. And he said, hi, pup. And it ran away. And this happened while we slept. They ran this down, this deer down, and killed it while we slept. Now, it's possible the single wolf did it. But, I mean, wouldn't you think they'd make more noise than that? We never heard it. And that's part of the rewilding of the middle fork. So that was pretty awesome. And then, then you get to, someone would ask me about Gooseberry. This is Gooseberry Cabin here, Gooseberry Ranger Station. It's in a, an area of Burn, but it's really gorgeous up there. Uh, it's, the Continental Divide Trail. Again, probably less used than it was when I was in there and working in the early 80s, for sure, less used. This is one of the channels of Gooseberry. This is the one of the, uh, Bud called it Beaver Town, USA. This is a Clack Creek and Beaver Dams, just loaded with fish. You can see the trilobite range up there. So Bud went through all this, and he is an elegant writer. I hope if you ever read my book, just for that reason, no other reason, and he's always, uh, in his mind, thinking about wilderness all the time. Like, here's what I got to address in that paper. One, two, and three. Uh, that kind of thing. And then Dean Lake, unfortunately, Bud uh, camped there and it rained all night. He never got to see the, <laughs> see Pentagon. We we were ahead of him. We did it in three days instead of four. And we um, we had great weather, although it was hazy. It was hazy from the fires in 2018. And he had little sign of fire. See, it's changed that way too. This switchback pass is just, Incredible looking. I mean, this is just one look at it. If you ever get a chance to go, the quickest place would be up to Spotted Bear River Trail to Pentagon, and then seven more miles to Switchback Pass. So it'd be about 17. But it's pretty spiritual looking and feeling. And so there's Pentagon. And I wasn't going to climb Kevin Mountain, which was up there. I said, oh, come on, Kevin, let's just go. It's so hot. No, come on, we're going to climb it. So we got to the top of Kevin Mountain. And this ended up being the cover shot on my wilderness life, uh, this same area. Kevin pushed me to do that, the little guy with the blankie. <laughs> so then we came down from Pentagon uh, uh, along the Spotted Bear River. And not many people know this, but there's a little corner of the Great Bear, which I thought was pretty awesome. It, it's on the Spotted Bear River. You'd never know it. It comes down and intersects it. So again, just retracing that step uh, that I mentioned to you, start at Morrison Creek, down to Schaefer, uh, Schaefer Meadows, over to Gooseberry, Pentagon, past Dean, switch back past Pentagon, cabin, and out. And imagine what, because at the end of Bud's uh, discussions, and I, I talked to Bill Hodge about this, the state director of the Montana Wildlife, uh, um, Montana Wilderness Association. And I said, do you agree that that Bud Moore presenting this at a, he, what he says in here is I'm, my staff meeting, I'm, I'm going to start this, my staff meeting uh, Monday morning. He didn't want, this was all proposed to be roaded. I mean, the, the, down Morrison Creek, and it was called the Continental Device Study. And, you know, in, we heard about it in, night, in the 19, uh, or in the scapegoat 50th anniversary too. There was no place in the Bob Great Bear that hadn't, doesn't have some plan to be roaded. Think of what would happen if they would put a road down to Schaefer Meadows. Oh. So sad. And, and anyway, Bud, in my mind, was someone who worked hard internally in the agency to maintain wilderness and, and to restrict the roads. And he used a couple of examples of people he talked to about it. So that, that's my thesis. And, and Bill can respond to that if he wants. But, and I'm not saying he was as integral maybe as some people, but he really worked. He was highly respected. How many of you said in here that you knew Bud? Or do you know who he is? He's very, very respected. And so, yes, exactly. Okay, yeah, Bob Marshall. Tell him about Bob Marshall's career. He was a forester. 
Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I wish we had a mic back there for you, but the other thing Bill said is his own personal wealth he used to, uh, uh, to actually to, to pay the folks at the Wilderness Society, which he founded, and then to uh, help pass the Wilderness Act, which cost some money to do that. So, but we appreciate Bill is a great. Uh, he has a lot of knowledge about the national scene on wilderness, so that's why I asked him about it. Thanks, bud, for doing that. Thank you. I don't think we don't. I don't think we have time for the trivia contest, but uh, I've got some pages if you want me to hand them up. It depends on whether you have to leave, and you could, and then we'll draw for a couple of books. What do you think? Might be just interesting for you to have them. What's that? Oh, questions. Let's go questions instead, and I'll leave the I'll leave the uh, the thing over where the book signing is. I'll leave the trivia. You guys have any questions? Yeah. And Bill, you might want to just make, make, make. Could you take it back to Bill and let him just mention a couple more things? Because I couldn't hear you very well from up there. Well, just explain, Bob. Most people don't realize that Bob Marshall was a Forest Service employee. Bob came out of being a master's in Robinson School, actually in the research And that's where he started these what is uh Osama Sun. And those of you who've been before me probably realize that. Originally, the work, all those were 